This is a devotional book by Ellen G. White. Our High Calling. Part 1. January. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Another year of life is now in the past. A new year is opening before us. What will be its record? What will we each inscribe upon its spotless pages? The manner in which we spend each passing day will decide this question. Let us enter upon the new year with our hearts cleansed from the defilement of selfishness and pride. Let us put away every sinful indulgence, and seek to become faithful, diligent learners in the school of Christ. A new year opens its unsullied pages before us. What shall we write upon them? Seek to begin this year with right purposes and pure motives. As beings who are accountable to God. Ever bear in mind that your acts are daily passing into history by the pen of the recording angel. You must meet them again when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened. If we connect with God, the source of peace, and light, and truth, His Spirit will flow through us as a channel, to refresh and bless all around us. This may be the last year of life to us. Shall we not enter upon it with thoughtful consideration? Shall not sincerity, respect, benevolence, mark our deportment toward all? Let us withhold nothing from Him who gave His precious life for us. Let us all consecrate to God the property He has entrusted to us. Above all, let us give Him ourselves, a free will offering. May the beginning of this year be a time that shall never be forgotten, a time when Christ shall come in among us, and say, Peace be unto you. Brethren and sisters, I wish you, one and all, a happy new year. We live in deeds, not years, in thoughts, not breaths, in feelings, not in figures on a dial. We should count time by heart throbs. He most lives, who thinks most. Feels the noblest, acts the best. Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Before you are two ways the broad road of self-indulgence and the narrow path of self-sacrifice. Into the broad road you can take selfishness, pride, love of the world, but those who walk in the narrow way must lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset. Which road have you chosen the road which leads to everlasting death, or the road which leads to glory and immortality? There never was a more solemn time in the history of the world than the time in which we are now living. Our eternal interests are at stake, and we should arouse to the importance of making our calling and election sure. We dare not risk our eternal interests on mere probabilities. We must be in earnest. What we are, what we are doing, what is to be our course of action in the future, are all questions of untold moment, and we cannot afford to be listless, indifferent, unconcerned. It becomes each one of us to inquire, what is eternity to me? Are our feet in the path that leads to heaven, or in the broad road that leads to perdition? Those who make a success of the Christian life will count all things as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Only those who are abiding in Christ can know what true life is. They realize the value of true religion. They have brought their talents of influence and means and ability to the altar of consecration, seeking only to know and do the will of Him who has died to redeem them. They know that the path they must travel is straight and narrow, and that they will have to meet many obstacles and temptations, as they resist the enticements of the broader road that leads to ruin, but they will discern the footsteps of Jesus, and press onward toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in their Lord and Saviour. They will choose the royal way that leads to heaven. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusts in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. We often think that those who serve God have more trials than the unbeliever, 
and that the path marked out for them to travel in is rugged. But does the sinner enjoy his worldly pleasure and enjoyment unalloyed? Oh, no. There are times when the sinner is fearfully troubled. He fears God but does not love Him. Are the wicked free from disappointment, perplexity, earthly losses, poverty, and distress? Many of them suffer a lingering sickness. Yet have no strong and mighty one to lean upon, no strengthening grace from a higher power to support them in their weakness. They lean upon their own strength. They obtain no consolation by looking forward to the future, but a fearful uncertainty torments them, and thus they close their eyes in death, not finding any pleasure in looking forward to the resurrection morn, for they have no cheering hope that they shall have part in the first resurrection. The Christian is subject to sickness, disappointment, poverty, reproach, and distress. Yet amid all this he loves God, he chooses to do his will, and prizes nothing so highly as his approbation. In the conflicting trials and changing scenes of this life, he knows that there is one who knows it all, one who will bend his ear low to the cry of the sorrowful and distressed, one who can sympathize with every sorrow and soothe the keen anguish of every heart. Amid all his affliction, the Christian has strong consolation. And if God permits him to suffer a lingering, distressing sickness before he closes his eyes in death, he can with cheerfulness bear it all. He contemplates the future with heavenly satisfaction. A short rest in the grave, and then the life-giver will break the fetters of the tomb, release the captive, and bring him from his dusty bed immortal, never more to know pain, sorrow, or death. Oh, what a hope is the Christian's! Let this hope of the Christian be mine. Let it be yours. Oh how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for them that fear you, which you have wrought for them that trust in you before the sons of men. God scatters blessings all along our path to brighten our journey and lead our hearts out to love and praise Him, and He wants us to draw water from the well of salvation that our hearts may be refreshed. We may sing the songs of Zion, we may cheer our own hearts, and we may cheer the hearts of others, hope may be strengthened, darkness turned to light. God has not left us in a dark world as pilgrims and strangers seeking a better country, even in heavenly without giving us precious promises to lighten every burden. The borders of our path are strewn with fair flowers of promise. They blossom all around, sending forth rich fragrance. How many blessings we lose because we slight and overlook the blessings we daily receive, yearning for that which we have not. Common mercies which thickly strew our pathway are forgotten and undervalued. We may learn lessons from the humble things of God in nature. The flower in dark and humble places responds to all the rays of light it can get, and puts forth its leaves. The caged bird sings in the prison cage, in the sunless tenement, as if in the lordly, sunny dwelling. God knows whether we will make a wise and saving use of His blessings, He will never give them to us to abuse. God loves the thankful heart, trusting implicitly in His words of promise, gathering comfort and hope and peace from them. And He will reveal to us still greater depths of His love. If we praised God's holy name as we should, the flame of love would be kindled in many hearts. The praise of God should continually be in our hearts and on our lips. This is the very best way to resist the temptation to indulge in idle, frivolous conversation. The Lord would have us look up, and be grateful to Him that there is a heaven. Let us grasp by living faith the rich promises of God, and be thankful from morning till night. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walks to direct his steps. The road through night's canyon, always perilous to the inexperienced traveler, is often impassable in the rainy season. We were very thankful for a pilot in this part of our journey. I dared not look either to the right or left to view the scenery, but, holding the lines firmly, and guiding my horse in the narrow passage, I followed our leader. Carelessness here would have been fatal. Had our horse turned out of the right path, we should have plunged down a steep precipice, into the ravine below. As we rode along in almost breathless silence, I could but think how forcibly this dangerous ride illustrates the Christian's experience. We are making life's journey amid the perils of the last days. We need to watch carefully every step, and to be sure that we are following our great leader. 
skepticism, infidelity, dissipation, and crime are on every hand. It would be an easy matter to let go the reins of self-control and plunge over the precipice to sure destruction. Infinite love has cast up a pathway upon which the ransomed of the Lord may pass from earth to heaven. That path is the Son of God. Angel guides are sent to direct our erring feet. Heaven's glorious ladder is let down in every man's path, barring his way to vice and folly. He must trample upon a crucified Redeemer ere he can pass onward to a life of sin. Our Heavenly Father's voice is calling us, Come up hither. The humble, trusting ones are guided and protected in the way of peace. But he who is infinite in wisdom compels none to accept heaven's most precious gift compels none to walk in the path which has been cast up at such a cost. Every one is permitted to choose for himself the narrow, shining steep that leads to heaven, or that broader and easier way which ends in death. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God's love for the world was not manifest because He sent His Son, but because He loved the world He sent His Son into the world that divinity clothed with humanity might touch humanity, while divinity lays hold of divinity. Though sin had produced a gulf between man and his God, a divine benevolence provided a plan to bridge that gulf. And what material did He use? A part of Himself. The brightness of the Father's glory came to a world all seared and marred with the curse, and in His own divine character, in His own divine body, bridged the gulf. The windows of heaven were opened and the showers of heavenly grace in healing streams came to our benighted world. Had God given us less we could not have been saved. But He gave to our world so abundantly that it could not be said that He could love us more. Then how foolish is the position taken that there is to be a second probation after the first is exhausted. God has exhausted His benevolence in pouring out all heaven to man in one great gift. Only in comprehending the value of this offering can we comprehend infinity. Oh the breadth and height and depth of the love of God! Who of finite beings can comprehend it? God claims the whole of the affections of man, the whole heart, the whole soul, the whole mind, the whole strength. He lays claim to all that there is of man, because he has poured out the whole treasure of heaven by giving us his all at once. Reserving nothing greater that heaven can do. When I commence writing on this subject, I go on and on, and try to get beyond the outer edge, but I fail. When we shall reach the mansions above, Jesus will himself lead the white-robed ones, made white in the blood of the Lamb, to the Father. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve Him day and night in His temple, and He that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Those who receive Christ by faith will be looked upon by heaven as precious pearls for which the merchantman has paid an infinite price, and the human agents who find Christ will realize that they have found a heavenly treasure. They will be anxious to sell all that they have in order to buy the field which contains this treasure. As they contemplate the love of God, as the plan of salvation opens to their view, as the mystery of Christ's condescension becomes plainer to them. As they see the sacrifice that He made for them, they count nothing too dear to give up for His sake. The more they dwell upon the wonderful love of God, the vaster becomes its proportion, and the brightness of the glory of God becomes too glorious for mortal vision. The Lord God of heaven collected all the riches of the universe, and laid them down in order to purchase the pearl of lost humanity. The Father gave all His divine resources into the hands of Christ in order that the richest blessings of heaven might be poured out upon a fallen race. God could not express greater love than He has expressed in giving the Son of His bosom to this world. This gift was given to man to convince him that God had left nothing undone that He could do, that there is nothing held in reserve, but that all heaven has been poured out in one vast gift. The present and eternal happiness of man consists in receiving God's love, and in keeping God's commandments. Christ is our Redeemer. He is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the fountain in which we may be washed and cleansed from all impurity. He is the costly sacrifice that has been given for the reconciliation of man. The universe of heaven, the world's unfallen, the fallen world, 
and the confederacy of evil cannot say that God could do more for the salvation of man than he has done. Never can his gift be surpassed, never can he display a richer depth of love. Calvary represents his crowning work. The Lord would have his followers enraptured with God through the knowledge of his paternal character. For you are my hope, O Lord God, you are my trust from my youth. Jesus calls to every wanderer, My son, give me your heart. The youth cannot be happy without the love of Jesus. He is waiting with pitying tenderness to hear the confessions of the wayward, and to accept their penitence. He watches for some return of gratitude from us, as the mother watches for the smile of recognition from her beloved child. The great God teaches us to call him Father. He would have us understand how earnestly and tenderly his heart yearns over us in all our trials and temptations. The young should be constantly growing in grace, and in a knowledge of the truth. The Creator of all things, with whom are all the treasures of wisdom, has promised to be the guide of their youth. He who has conquered in their behalf all the powers of evil asks for their homage. There can be no higher knowledge than the knowledge of him whom to know aright is life and peace, no pure, deeper affection than the love of our Saviour. There are temptations on every hand to ensnare the feet of the unwary. Ungodly, corrupt youth exert a strong influence to lead others into forbidden paths. These are among the most successful agents of Satan. The lovers of the world will often approach under a garb of friendship, and attempt to introduce its customs and practices. Let every true soldier stand ready to resist these allurements. Satan attacks us at our weak points, but we need not be overcome. The assault may be severe and protracted, but God has promised help for us, and in His strength we may conquer. The precepts and promises of God's Word will arm you with divine power to resist the enemy. Satan will be baffled and defeated when he finds the heart preoccupied with the truth of God. We need also to be often found at the throne of grace. Earnest, persevering prayer, uniting our human weakness to omnipotence, will give us the victory. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In our world there are two classes. One is made up of those who behold a crucified and risen Saviour. The other includes all who have chosen to look away from the cross, and to follow the leadings of satanic influences. The latter class are busily engaged in putting stumbling blocks before God's people, to cause them to fall, and turn from the path of obedience into the broad way of disobedience and death. Many choose unrighteousness because Satan presents it in such a way that it seems attractive to those who are not on guard against his wiles. And he works in a special manner through unsanctified men and women who profess to be children of God. In some way or other the enemy will seek to deceive all, even the very elect. Only as we are partakers of the divine nature can we escape the corrupting influences that are brought to bear upon us by the enemy of our souls. As Satan seeks to break down the barriers of the soul. By tempting us to indulge in sin, we must by living faith retain our connection with God, and have confidence in His strength to enable us to overcome every besetment. We are to flee from evil, and seek righteousness, meekness, and holiness. It is time for every one of us to decide whose side we are on. The agencies of Satan will work with every mind that will allow itself to be worked by him. But there are also heavenly agencies waiting to communicate the bright rays of the glory of God to all who are willing to receive him. It is ours to choose whether we will be numbered with the servants of Christ or the servants of Satan. Every day we show by our conduct whose service we have chosen. Dear young reader, what choice have you made? What is the record of your daily life? Then Jesus spoke again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All who are traveling the road to heaven need a safe guide. We must not walk in human wisdom. It is our privilege to listen to the voice of Christ speaking to us as we walk the journey of life, and His words are always words of wisdom. Satan is working with great diligence to compass the ruin of the souls of men. He has come down with great power. Knowing that he has but a short time to work. Our only safety lies in following closely after Christ, 
walking in His wisdom, and practicing His truth. We cannot always readily detect the working of Satan, we do not know where he lays his traps. But Jesus understands the subtle arts of the enemy, and he can keep our feet in safe paths. I am the way, the truth, and the life Christ declares. What would be the use of a way direct and sure in its course to glory, if no light of truth shone upon that path? That traveler should desire it. What would be the use of truth shining on the way if there was no life in the persons that walked in the way, in the pilgrim's journey from the earthly to the heavenly? Having the statement of Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life, all who believe in Jesus, the leader, may in confidence walk heavenward, sure that they are in the path outlined in the word as the way. Christ, His character and work, is the center and circumference of all truth. He is the chain upon which the jewels of doctrine are linked. In Him is found a complete system of truth, those who walk in obedience will know what truth is. In order to know the truth, we must be willing to obey. Those whose affections are placed on the world are not willing to give up their plans for the plans of Christ. They walk in darkness, not knowing whither they go. The precious light of truth flashes upon the pathway of everyone who seeks for it. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, therefore the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. Let no one feel that he is stepping down and becoming a child of God. It was the only begotten Son of God who stepped down. Leaving His splendor, His majesty, His high command, and clothing His divinity with humanity, that humanity might touch humanity, and divinity lay hold upon divinity, He came to this earth, and in our behalf suffered the death of the cross. Christ has made an infinite sacrifice. He gave His own life for us. He took upon His divine soul the result of the transgression of God's law. Laying aside His royal crown, He condescended to step down, step by step, to the level of fallen humanity. He hung upon Calvary's cross, dying in our behalf, that we might have eternal life. Does it seem a small thing that He should endure all this, that we might be called the sons of God? Does it seem a small thing to you to become members of the royal family? Children of the heavenly King, partakers of an immortal inheritance. Such is the infinite goodness of God that through Jesus Christ's merits He not only spares but pardons and justifies us, and through the righteousness of Christ imputes righteousness to us, and exalts and ennobles us by making us children of His adoption. We become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly King. He lifts men and women from their degradation and exalts them in righteousness. He calls them His jewels, and a peculiar treasure, unto Him. They are trophies of His grace and power, and of His greatness and riches in glory. They therefore are not their own, but are bought with a price, and through the extraordinary office of the Atonement of Christ have been brought into nearness and the most sacred relationship to Jesus Christ. They are called His heritage, His children, the members of Christ's body, of His flesh and of His bones, yes, they are joined to the Lord by intimate relationship with Him. We should contemplate the love of Jesus, His mission and His work in reference to us as individuals. We are to say, Jesus so loved me that He gave His own life to save me. The Father loves me, for God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It becomes us to ascertain upon what terms Christ promises the gift of eternal life. I answer, it is upon our faith. The gift of God's dear Son makes the promises of God ours of a surety. How many can say, He saves me? I know that He wants that I should be saved. He looks upon me as a value in His sight, and therefore I know that my thoughts, my words, and my works, all pass in review before Him. Everything that is connected with the purchase of the blood of Christ is of value in the sight of God. By the price paid for our redemption we are under obligation to devote our entire affections to Christ. We are to give God all there is of us, and in giving to God our all. Are we to consider that we sustain a great loss? No, for in giving to Him our talents, we are doubling them. Every gift He has given to us, when returned to Him, receives His blessing, that it may have increased influence in the work of God. 
wherever you may be, you are to realize that you belong to Christ. The gift of Christ to the world was beyond computation, and no power could compete with God by giving a gift that would bear any comparison to the value of heaven's best treasure. The greatness of this gift was to furnish men with a theme of thanksgiving and praise that would last through time and through eternity. Having given his all in Christ, God lays claim to the heart, mind, soul, and strength of man. Looking upon the treasure which God has provided in the full and complete gift of Christ, we can exclaim, Herein is love. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Is it not wonderful that we can receive the rich current of grace from Deity, and work in harmony with Deity? What does Deity want with us, poor, weak, and feeble as we are? What can Deity do with us? Everything, if we are willing to surrender all. God loves every youth. He knows all about your trials. He knows that you have to battle against the powers of darkness. Who strive to gain control of the human mind. God's purpose for His children is that they shall grow to the full stature of men and women in Christ. In order to do this, we must use aright every power of mind and soul and body. We cannot afford to waste any mental or physical strength. Satan has summoned the hosts of darkness to war against the saints. We cannot afford to be indifferent to his attacks. He comes in many ways, and we must have clear spiritual discernment, that we may be able to discern when he is seeking to gain possession of our minds. God calls on those on whom the light of truth is shining to take their stand in his army. He calls upon them to show their loyalty by walking in the light he has given. The Lord desires you to understand the position you occupy as sons and daughters of the Most High, children of the Heavenly King. He desires you to live in close connection with Him. Cut away from everything frivolous. Do not think that you must indulge in this pleasure and that pleasure. Determine that you will be on the Lord's side. Take firm hold of the arm of divine power. Harness your habits. Put on the bit and bridle. Say, I love the Lord, and I am determined to use every particle of my intelligence in His work. If you will stand under the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel, faithfully doing His service, you need never yield to temptation, for one stands by your side who is able to keep you from falling. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. The same lesson that Christ bade Moses to give to the children of Israel in the wilderness is for all such souls suffering under the plague spot of sin. From the billowy cloud Christ spoke to Moses and told him to make a brazen serpent and place it upon a pole, and then bid all that were bitten with the fiery serpents to look and live. What if, in the place of looking as Christ commanded them, they had said, I do not believe it will do me the least bit of good to look. I am too great a sufferer from the sting of the poisonous serpent. Obedience was the object to be gained, implicit and blind obedience, without stopping to inquire the reason or the science of the matter. Christ's word was, Look and live. We want clear views of what Jesus is to us. We want to have distinct views of the victories gained in our behalf. He spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. He broke the fetters of the tomb and came forth to take again his life that he laid down for us. He ascended on high, having led captivity captive and received gifts for men. All this suffering he endured for us. He will be our helper and he will be our refuge in every time of need. He should be revealed in our Christian experience as all-sufficient, a present Savior. Only look and live. We dishonor God when we do not go forth from the dark cellar of doubts unto the upper chamber of hope and faith. When the light shines in all its brightness let us take hold on Jesus Christ by the mighty hand of faith. No longer cultivate your doubts by expressing them and pouring them into other minds, and thus becoming an agent of Satan to sow the seeds of doubt. Talk faith, live faith, cultivate love to God, evidence to the world all that Jesus is to you. Magnify His holy name. Tell of His goodness, talk of His mercy, and tell of His power. The thief comes not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy, 
I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. What fullness is expressed in the words, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. This life is what we must have, and we must have it more abundantly. God will breathe this life into every soul that dies to self and lives to Christ. But entire self-renunciation is required. Unless this takes place, we carry with us the evil that destroys our happiness. But when self is crucified, Christ lives in us, and the power of the Spirit attends our efforts. I wish we could be what God would have us all light in the Lord. We need to reach a higher standard, but we can never do this until self is laid on the altar, until we let the Holy Spirit control us, molding and fashioning us according to the divine similitude. We must daily consecrate ourselves to God's service. We must come to God in faith. We need to humble ourselves before God. It is self that we have first to do with. Criticize the heart closely. Search it to see what hinders the free access of God's Spirit. We must receive the Holy Ghost. Then we shall have power to prevail with God. A mere assent to truth is not enough. Daily we must live the truth. We must shut ourselves in with God, surrendering all to Him. To listen to the great and grand truths of the Word is not enough. We must ask ourselves the question. Does Christ dwell in my heart by faith? He alone can show us our necessity and reveal the dignity and glory of the truth. At the altar of self-sacrifice the appointed place of meeting between God and the soul, we receive from the hand of God the celestial torch which searches the heart, revealing its great need of an abiding Christ. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. We are passing through an enemy's land. Foes are upon every side to hinder our advancement. They hate God and all who follow after Him and bear His name. But those who are our enemies are the Lord's enemies, and although they are strong and artful, yet the Captain of our salvation who leads us can vanquish them. As the sun disperses the clouds from its path, so will the Son of Righteousness remove the obstacles to our progress. We may cheer our souls by looking at the things unseen which will cheer and animate us in our journey. If we cling to Him by living faith, saying with Jacob, I will not let you go, if we entreat, cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me, the promise is to us, I will never leave you. Nor forsake you. We have read an account of a noble prince who carried the picture of his father always near his heart and on important occasions when there was danger of forgetting him, he would take out the likeness and view it and say, let me do nothing unbecoming so excellent a father. As Christians, God has claims upon us that we should never, never lose sight of for a moment, and as we are his children by adoption, how careful should we be that we retain his image and do nothing that will belittle or degrade our holy calling. For we rank among the royal family. God has made us as vessels unto honor, prepared unto every good work. This people have I formed for myself, they shall shew forth my praise. God's people are called a crown, a diadem. Satan would eagerly seize the Lord's treasure, but God has secured it so that Satan cannot obtain it. Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. We are secure, perfectly secure from the enemy's subtlety while we have unwavering trust in God. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. Oh, that we could all realize the nearness of heaven to earth. When the earth-born children know it not, they have the angels of light as their companions, for the heavenly messengers are sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. A silent witness guards every soul that lives, seeking to win and draw him to Christ. The angels never leave the tempted one a prey to the enemy who would destroy the souls of men if permitted to do so. As long as there is hope, until they resist the Holy Spirit to their eternal ruin, men are guarded by heavenly intelligences. Oh, 
that all could behold our precious Saviour as He is, a Saviour. Let His hand draw aside the veil which conceals His glory from our eyes. It shows Him in His high and holy place. What do we see? Our Saviour, not in a position of silence and inactivity. He is surrounded with heavenly intelligences, cherubim, and seraphim, ten thousand times ten thousand of angels. All these heavenly beings have one object above all others, in which they are intensely interested His Church in a world of corruption. They are working for Christ under His commission, to save to the uttermost all who look to Him and believe in Him, heavenly angels are commissioned to watch the sheep of Christ's pasture. When Satan with his deceptive snares would deceive if possible the very elect, these angels set in operation influences that will save the tempted souls if they will take heed to the word of the Lord. Realize their danger, and say, No, I will not enter into that scheme of Satan. I have an elder brother on the throne in heaven, who has shown that he has a tender interest in me, and I will not grieve his heart of love. Living amid these opposing forces, we may through the exercise of faith and prayer, call to our side a retinue of heavenly angels, who will guard us from every corrupting influence. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. This pledge was given not only to Israel but to all who are obedient to God's word. Those who live amid the perils of the last days may realize that just as at the beginning of their experience the truth united them to the Saviour, so he who is the author and finisher of their faith will perfect the work he has begun for them. God is faithful, by whom we are called to fellowship with his Son. As men and women cooperate with God in doing the work he has given them, they go forward from strength to greater strength. As they exercise simple faith, believing day by day that God will not fail to establish them in Christ, God says to them as he did to ancient Israel, You are an holy people unto the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a special people unto Himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Thus God is able and willing to lead all who will be led. He desires to teach each one a lesson of constant trust, unwavering faith, and unquestioning submission. He says to each one, I am the Lord your God. Walk with me, and I will fill your path with light. But God requires obedience to all His commands. The only way in which it is possible for men to be happy is by rendering obedience to the laws of God's kingdom life, with its privileges and endowments, is God's gift. Let us remember that all we have comes from God, and is to be holy and freely consecrated to Him. Paul declares, I count all things but loss for the excellency of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God by faith. The sacrifice of our ideas, our will, is necessary if we would be one with Christ in God. All we have and are, must be laid at Christ's feet. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. You are safe only as you trust in God. We have a vigilant foe to contend against. Christ saw that it was not possible for man to overcome the powerful foe in his own strength, therefore he came in person from the courts of heaven and bore in behalf of man the test that Adam failed to endure. Christ overcame Satan, making it possible for man to overcome on his own behalf in the name of Christ. But the victory can only be gained in Christ's name. Through His grace. When burdened, when pressed with temptation, when the feelings and desires of the natural heart are clamoring for the victory, earnest, fervent, importunate prayer in the name of Christ brings Jesus to your side as a helper, and through His name you gain the victory and Satan is vanquished. I implore you to trust wholly in God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. The Christian life is a life of conflict, or self-denial and conquest. It is a continual battle and a march. Every act of obedience to Christ, every victory obtained over self, is a step in the march to glory and final victory. Take Christ for your guide and He will lead you safely along. The pathway may be rough and thorny in the ascent steep, requiring toil. You may have to press on when weary, when you long for rest. 
you may have to fight on when faint and hope on when discouraged, but, with Christ as your guide, you cannot lose the path of immortal life. You cannot fail to reach the exalted seat by the side of your guide, whose own feet trod the rough path before you, evening the way for your feet. If you follow pride and selfish ambition you will find it pleasant at first, but the end is pain and sorrow. You may follow selfishness, which will promise you much but will poison and embitter your life. To follow Christ is safe. He will not suffer the powers of darkness to hurt one hair of your head. Trust in your Redeemer and you are safe. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If there were no light, there would be no shade. But while the shade comes by the sun, it is not created by it. It is some obstruction that causes the shadow. So darkness emanates not from God, but is the result of an intruding object between the soul and God. Disregard of the light that God has given brings the sure result. It creates a shadow, a darkness that is more dark because of the light which has been sent. If a man withdraws himself from light and evidence, and yields to Satan's seducing arts, he himself draws the curtain of unbelief about him, so that light cannot be distinguished from darkness. More light and evidence would only be misunderstood by him. The greater the evidence, the greater will be the indifference. This will lead the deceived soul to call darkness light and truth error. Satan is constantly working to lead men to deny the light. It is but a step from the straightforward path to a diverging one, in which Satan leads the way, and where light is all darkness, and darkness light. It is a dangerous thing to open the heart to unbelief, for it drives the Spirit of God away from the heart, and Satan's suggestions come in. We must avoid the first admission of doubt and unbelief. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. God destroys no man. Every man who is destroyed will destroy himself. When a man stifles the admonitions of conscience, he sows the seeds of unbelief and these produce a sure harvest. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkens unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. It is your thought that your mistakes and transgressions have been so grievous that the Lord will not have respect unto your prayers, and will bless and save you. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer, and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to His perfect nature. But do not be discouraged. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power, that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you, and your indifference and unconcern are passing away. No deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not see and realize its own sinfulness. The soul that is transformed by grace will admire His divine character. But if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. The less we see to esteem in ourselves, the more we shall see to esteem in the infinite purity and loveliness of our Saviour. A view of our own sinfulness drives us to Him who can pardon. God does not deal with us as finite men deal with one another. His thoughts are thoughts of mercy, love, and tenderest compassion. He will abundantly pardon. He says, I have blotted out, as a thick cloud, your transgressions. Look up, you who are tried, tempted, and discouraged, look up. It is ever safe to look up, it is fatal to look down. If you look down, the earth reels and sways beneath you, nothing is sure. But heaven above you is calm and steady, and there is divine aid for every climber. The hand of the infinite is reaching over the battlements of heaven to grasp yours in its strong embrace.
The mighty Helper is nigh to bless, lift up, and encourage the most erring, the most sinful, if they will look to Him by faith. But the sinner must look up. Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. To enlarge our views of God's goodness, Christ calls upon us to behold the works of His hands. Behold the fowls of the air, He says, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Though men and women have sinned grievously, they are not forsaken. The hand that upholds the world, upholds and strengthens his weakest child. The great master artist, whose skill is infinitely beyond the skill of any human being. Who gives to the lily of the field its delicate and beautiful tints, cares for the little sparrow. Not one falls to the ground without his notice. If the flower is given a beauty that outvies the glory of Solomon, what can be the measurement of the estimate God places on his purchased heritage? Christ points us to the care bestowed on the things that wither in a day, to show us how much love God must have for the beings created in his own image. He opens before us the volume of providence. And bids us behold the names written therein. In this volume every human being has a page, on which is written the events of his life history. And from the mind of God these names are never absent for a moment. Wonderful indeed is God's love and care for the beings He has created. That He might save the souls of perishing human beings, He made a gift of such magnitude that it can never be said that God could have made His gift, His donation to the human family, greater. His gift defies computation. All this God did that man might become impregnated with the divine love and benevolence. Thus he would assure sinners that sins of the greatest magnitude can be forgiven if the transgressor seeks for pardon, surrendering himself, body, soul, and spirit, to be transformed by the grace of God and changed into his likeness. In behalf of man God has poured out the whole treasury of heaven, and in return he expects and claims our entire affections. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Jesus wants you to be happy, but you cannot be happy in having your own way and following the impulses of your own heart. Our notions, our peculiarities, are wholly human and must not be humored or indulged. Self is to be crucified, not now and then but daily, and the physical, mental, and spiritual must be subordinate to the will of God. The glory of God, the perfection of Christian character, is to be the aim, the purpose, of our life. Christ's followers must imitate Christ in disposition. Like Christ is the watchword, not like your father or your mother, but like Jesus Christ hid in Christ, clothed with Christ's righteousness, imbued with the Spirit of Christ. All the peculiarities given us as an inheritance or acquired by indulgence or through erroneous education must be thoroughly overcome, decidedly resisted. Love of esteem and pride of opinion, all must be brought to the sacrifice. Jesus is our helper, in Him and through Him we must conquer. The grace of Christ is waiting your demand upon it. He will give you grace and strength as you need it if you ask Him. The religion of Christ will bind and restrain every unholy passion, will stimulate to energy, to self-discipline, and industry, even in the matters of homely, everyday life, leading us to learn economy, tact, and self-denial, and to endure even privation without a murmur. The Spirit of Christ in the heart will be revealed in the character, will develop noble qualities and powers. My grace is sufficient says Christ. God has done so much to make it possible for us to be free in Christ, free from the slavery of wrong habits and evil inclinations. Dear young friends, will you not strive to be free in Christ? You point to this and that professed Christian, saying, we have no confidence in them. If their lives are examples of Christianity, we want none of it. Look not at those around you. Look instead at the only perfect pattern, the man Christ Jesus. Nevertheless I am continually with you, you hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Before you engage in any important work, remember that Jesus is your counselor, and that it is your privilege to cast all your care upon him. Do not keep Jesus in the background and never mention His name, never call the attention of your friends to Him who is at your side to be your counselor. 
would not your friends look upon you as disrespectful were they at your side? And you never spoke to them or of them. Many complain that Jesus seems a long way off. Who has placed him, a long way off? Has it not been your own course of action that has separated you from Jesus? He has not forsaken you, but you have forsaken him for other lovers. It is when you wander from his side, and are charmed with the voice of the seducer, and fasten your affections upon some trifling thing, that you are in danger of losing your peace and trust and confidence in God. Then it is that Satan presents to you the thought that Jesus has forsaken you. But is it not that you have forsaken Jesus? We dare not let his name languish on our lips, and his love and memory die out of our hearts. Well, says the cold, formal professor, this is making Christ too much like a human being, but the Word of God warrants us to have these very ideas. It is the want of these practical, definite views of Christ, that hinders so many from having a genuine experience in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. This is the reason that many are fearing and doubting and mourning. Their ideas of Christ and the plan of salvation are vague, dreary, and confused. If they had, like David, set the Lord ever before them, their feet would be upon solid rock. Behold Jesus crucified for you. Behold Him grieved with your sins, and when you pray, repent, and earnestly desire to see Him as your sin-pardoning Redeemer, ready to bless you, and to hear your acknowledgement of Him. Keep close to His side. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Most wondrous book. Bright candle of the Lord. Star of eternity. The only light, by which the bark of man can navigate the sea of life, and gain the coast of bliss securely. Why should not this book this precious treasure be exalted and esteemed as a valued friend? This is our chart across the stormy sea of life. It is our guidebook, showing us the way to the eternal mansions, and the character we must have to inhabit them. There is no book the perusal of which will so elevate and strengthen the mind as the study of the Bible. Here the intellect will find themes of the most elevated character to call out its powers. There is nothing that will so endow with vigor all our faculties as bringing them in contact with the stupendous truths of revelation. The effort to grasp and measure these great thoughts expands the mind. We may dig down deep into the mine of truth, and gather precious treasures with which to enrich the soul. Here we may learn the true way to live, the safe way to die. A familiar acquaintance with the scriptures sharpens the discerning powers. And fortifies the soul against the attacks of Satan. The Bible is the sword of the Spirit, which will never fail to vanquish the adversary. It is the only true guide in all matters of faith and practice. The reason why Satan has so great control over the minds and hearts of men is that they have not made the word of God the man of their counsel, and all their ways have not been tried by the true test. The Bible will show us what course we must pursue to become heirs of glory. As the heart is open to the entrance of the word, light from the throne of God will shine into the soul. That word, cherished in the heart, will yield to the student a treasure of knowledge that is priceless. Its ennobling principles will stamp the character with honesty and truthfulness, temperance and integrity. I have chosen the way of truth, your judgments have I laid before me. The cause of God needs men and women who will stand on the platform of truth without wavering, and who will hold the banner of truth firmly aloft, so that no man can fail to see on which side they are standing. Their position is to be clearly defined. Their hearts are to be pure and holy, free from pretense or deception, the truth must find an abiding place in the heart. Then through the power of the Holy Spirit it will exert its influence in all you do and say. Shall we try to keep the truth out of sight? No, no, not for a moment. It is to be sacredly regarded. Its principles are to be consulted in all your transactions. It is to be a counselor in all your difficulties, a guide in all your relations of life, a present help in every time of need. In public, in private, where no human eye can see, where no ear but God's can hear, there the truth should control us, directing our thoughts, prompting our words and deeds. You may show to the world that the truth which you profess sanctifies and ennobles the character and leads to industry and frugality. 
while it avoids avarice, overreaching, and every species of dishonesty. In your words manifest patience and forbearance, and you may every day be preaching a sermon upon the power of truth and do effectual service to the cause of God. Let no one say that the truth you profess makes you no different from the worldling. Do not give the least occasion for anyone to speak ill of your faith because you are not sanctified through the truth. When the truth as it is in Jesus molds our characters, it will be seen to be truth indeed. As it is contemplated by the true believer, it will grow brighter, shining in its original beauty. As we behold it, it will increase in value, brightening in its own natural loveliness, quickening and vivifying the mind, and subduing our selfish, unchristlike coarseness of character. It will elevate our aspirations, enabling us to reach the perfect standard of holiness. Teach me your way, O Lord, I will walk in your truth, unite my heart to fear your name. Say with your whole heart, I will walk in your truth. Every resolution expressed in the fear of God will give strength to purpose and to faith. It will tend to stimulate and to humble, to strengthen and confirm. I will walk in your truth. Truth deserves our confidence nonetheless because the world is flooded with fables. Because error and counterfeit are in circulation it only evidences the fact that there is truth. Genuine truth, somewhere. It is not enough for us to hear the truth only. God requires of us obedience. Blessed are they that hear the word of God, and keep it. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. We may walk in the enjoyment of the truth. It need not be to us a yoke of bondage, but a consolation, a message to us of glad tidings of great joy, animating our hearts and causing us to make melody in our hearts unto God. Through patience and comfort of the Scriptures we have hope. The Christian hope is not gloomy, comfortless. Oh, no, no. It does not shut us up in a prison of doubts and fears. The truth makes free those who love and are sanctified through it. They walk in the glorious liberty of the sons of God. We who claim to believe the truth should reveal its fruits in our words and character. We are to be far advanced in a knowledge of Jesus Christ, in the reception of His love for God and for our neighbor, in order to have the sunlight of heaven shining in our daily life. Truth must reach down to the deepest recesses of the soul, and cleanse away everything unlike the Spirit of Christ, and the vacuum be supplied by the attributes of His character who was pure and holy and undefiled, that all the springs of the heart may be as flowers, fragrant with perfume, a sweet-smelling savor, a savor of life unto life. It is truth enshrined in the soul that makes one a man of God. Buy the truth, and sell it not, also wisdom, and instruction, and understanding. The truth is precious, it has wrought important changes upon the life and character, exerting a masterly influence over words, deportment, thoughts, and experience. The religion of Jesus Christ never degrades the receiver. If it finds men and women earthly, common, coarse, unkindly in words, harsh in speech, selfish and self-caring, truth received in the heart commences its purifying, refining process. In words. In dress, in all our habits, there is seen reformation and those things that please God. Then all the world may see its influence in the transforming process. Truth refines the taste and sanctifies the judgment. It elevates and ennobles, and is silently and constantly doing its leavening work till the whole being is cleansed and made a vessel unto honor, under the operation of the Holy Spirit, to make the receiver of truth fit for the society of pure and sinless angels. A salvation which was purchased for humanity at such an infinite cost should be held in the most precious vessel by every believer. That which is of such value should ever be highly regarded and not cheapened and made common by the coarseness and roughness retained by those who receive the truth. Truth as it is in Jesus is not cold and lifeless and formal. Truth is full of warmth, of evidence from the presence of Jesus. We have a message to bear to the world. It involves a cross. The truths are unpleasant because they require self-denial and self-sacrifice. Then how essential that those who bear the truth, as they speak the truth faithfully, shall by every word and act show that the love of Christ moves them. Truth is always lovely, 
and those who live the truth as it is in Jesus should study how to present the truth so that its loveliness may appear. Treasure the truth above everything, sell it not for any price. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The Bible is second to no other book, it is without a rival. A knowledge and acceptance of its teachings will impart vigor and health of mind. A comprehension of its teachings requires the student to grasp the knowledge of God's infinite will. The Word of God teaches men and women how to become the sons and daughters of God. No other book, no other study, can equal this, the principles it instills. Like the power and nature of its author, are omnipotent. It is capable of imparting the highest education to which the mortal mind can attain. It is not safe for us to turn from the Holy Scriptures, with only a casual reading of their sacred pages. Rein the mind up to the high task that has been set before it, and study with determined interest, that you may understand divine truth. Those who do this, will be surprised to find to what the mind can attain. The minds of all who make the Word of God their study will enlarge. Far more than any other study its influence is calculated to increase the powers of comprehension and endow every faculty with a new power. It brings the mind in contact with broad, ennobling principles of truth. It brings all heaven into close connection with human minds, imparting wisdom and knowledge and understanding. In dealing with commonplace productions, and feeding on the writings of uninspired men, the mind becomes dwarfed and cheapened. The understanding unconsciously accommodates itself to the comprehension of the things with which it is familiar. And in the consideration of these finite things, the understanding is weakened, its powers contracted, and after a time it becomes unable to expand. All knowledge gained in this life of probation which will help us to form characters that will fit us to be companions of the saints in light is true education. It will bring blessings to ourselves and others in this life, and will secure to us the future, immortal life with its imperishable riches. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases? Christ has given us His Word, that men and women may be thoroughly furnished with a remedy for all spiritual diseases. The Word is a test of human character. It points out the disease, and prescribes the remedy. In the Word is a prescription for every spiritual ailment. The plain commands of God will exert a healthful influence upon the mind, and upon the whole body. If taken in faith and faithfully practiced, its remedies are infallible. Before the humblest is opened the promises of the Word of God. God declares, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that gives to all men liberally. He will never be sent away empty. And the man who lives by every word of God will improve in mental and moral capabilities. He will have a clearer understanding than he manifested before he opened his heart to the entrance of the Word of Life. Connected by faith with the living source of wisdom and knowledge, the mental powers will grow and expand. While the powers of the intellect were under the sway of Satan, the whole man was deformed. But when the power of the truth is brought into the heart, it influences the entire being. The Lord has uttered His voice in His Holy Word. Those blessed pages are full of instruction and life, harmonious with truth. They are a perfect rule of conduct. Instructions are given, principles are laid down, which apply to every circumstance in life, even though some particular case may not be stated. Nothing is left unrevealed which is essential to a complete system of faith and a correct line of practice. Every duty that God requires at our hands is made plain. None will err from the right path who meekly and honestly take the Bible as their guide, making it the man of their counsel. Depend on this, if you study the Word of God with a sincere desire to get help, the Lord will fill your soul with light. Your work will be approved of God, and your influence will be a savor of life. That which I see not teach me, if I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Take your Bible and present yourself before your Heavenly Father, saying, enlighten me, teach me what is truth. The Lord will regard your prayer, and the Holy Spirit will impress the truth upon your soul. In searching the Scriptures for yourself, you will become established in the faith. It is of the greatest importance that you continually search the Scriptures, storing the mind with the Word of God, 
for you may be separated from the companionship of Christians. And placed where you will not have the privilege of meeting with the children of God. You need the treasures of God's Word hidden in your heart, that when opposition comes upon you, you may bring everything to the Scriptures. We are living in the last days, when error of a most deceptive character is accepted and believed, while truth is discarded. Many are drifting into darkness and infidelity, picking flaws with the Bible, bringing in superstitious inventions, unscriptural theories, and speculations of vain philosophy, but it is the duty of everyone to seek a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. Truth is efficient only as it is carried out in practical life. If the Word of God condemns some habit you have indulged, a feeling you have cherished, a spirit you have manifested, turn not from the Word of God, but turn away from the evil of your doings, and let Jesus cleanse and sanctify your heart. Confess your faults, and forsake them. Do not merely assent to the truth. And fail to be a doer of the words of Christ. The truth must be applied to self, it must bring men and women who receive it to the rock, that they may fall upon the rock and be broken. Then Jesus can mold and fashion their characters after His own divine character. If we would listen to His voice, we must let silence reign in the heart. The clamors of self, its pretensions, its lusts, must be rebuked, and we must put on the robe of humility, and take our place as humble learners in the school of Christ.